So we're continuing our series on Bible 101, questions about the Bible. We've been looking at why they're different translations. So this is part two of like a four-part series on why are translations so different? Why does it matter? So last week we talked about how being a translator is tough, that you have to choose first off which fragments from original, not even original, early pieces you're going to use to base your translation on because not all the old copies of the books are the same. So you have to kind of figure out that. And then every time you read the Bible, you're reading someone else's interpretation of it. Because every translation is an interpretation. Choosing what word. Because not every word has a one-to-one -one exact correspondence between Hebrew and English, Greek and English. So no one's going straight to the source of the Bible. You're going straight to someone's interpretation of the Bible. So we're never reading the original. So English translations of the Bible began to appear in the 14th century, initially associated with the work of John Wycliffe. Now they were based off the Latin translation, so now you've got a translation of a translation happening. The first English translation based on original Hebrew and Greek appeared in the 16th century, associated with the work of William Tyndale. You might have heard of him before. The first complete Bible in English being that of Miles Coverdale in 1535, a contemporary of Luther. The King James Version, published in 1611 and sponsored by James I of England, soon became the authorized version for English-speaking Protestants and remained so for nearly 300 years. Now, many different English translations of the Bible have appeared since 1950. Why so many? Well, some reasons are good. For example, to update the language, new, older manuscripts have been found to be more exact. Other reasons are less admirable. But there's competition among publishing houses to reap the profits of Bible sales. Everybody wants to have their Bible to make some money off of. The most common recent English transitions will be found in your handout next week. I don't have a handout for it. I'll give it to you next week. So, translators in theory concern themselves with two basic matters. Accuracy and clarity. And those sometimes compete with each other. Because to be the most the act, most accurate word may not often be the most clear word in that circumstance because of the way idioms are used or how language changes. For instance, um, you know, often we talk about, you know, go with your heart. What does it mean to say go with your heart? Yeah, you know, hearts, we typically talk about the heart being the seat of feelings, right? Is it really the seed of feelings? No, it's an organ. In Hebrew, the heart is really the seed of wisdom and intellect. So you have to decide when you're translating something that talks about, you know, your heart, and you want to kind of put it in a more way people understand. You can use the word heart, and you would be very accurate, but will people get what you're meaning? Because we might read it now and think feeling, right? So some places they may translate that more mind instead of heart, because that's what they mean. But now you're not using the same word as them. So which is the right answer? These are the things where accuracy and clarity can compete with each other a bit. Um, you know, you want, we don't always use language in uh, the same way. So we have to think about those things. So like for one example, you know, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, right? Well, the Hebrew is just heart, soul, strength. The Greeks added mind later because, again, for them, mind was what they said with heart, but they wouldn't have understood that, so they added that in the New Testament when they were quoting the Old Testament because they wanted to think about you love the Lord your God with what's your intellect thinking. Hebrew thought was the intellect was the heart. That makes sense? So that's some of the issues with accuracy and clarity. So interpreters, they want to seek faithfulness to the text while writing in clear contemporary English. Beyond these common goals, so again, contemporary English is different. hundred years ago, English was different than it is today. Again, the reason why I have updated translations. Bible readers should learn to ask questions of any translation they use. Some of the basic questions to ask include the following. The preface of your Bible will usually give answers to these and other questions. One, what translation principles have been followed? 
Translating is not an exact science. No translation of the original Greek or Hebrew can be completely literal and still make sense to contemporary readers. The result is that every translation is an interpretation. That is, the point of view of the translator or translators will inevitably shape the translation, often unintentionally. Some translations, such as the NRSV, NASB, NIV, have more literal word-for-word -word translations with some slightly different translation emphasis. So those three on a kind of a scale, NASB is more literal. NRSV is more trying to be as literal as they can, but want to really have meaning at the forefront. NIV is going to try to go slightly more readable, easy to understand of those three. So for an example, uh, in Hebrew, when they speak of the power of God, they often use the Hebrew word yad, which means hand. So the right hand of God is the power of God because the right hand is where you chop with your sword and all that good stuff. So the NASB may talk about translate a verse the hand of God or God's right hand. The NRSV may translate that God's power because we may not understand the use of hand. So they're trying to make sure we know we're talking about God's power. So when you think about Jesus sitting at the right hand of the Father, what did they mean? Did they mean literal right hand? as like in a throne room, did they mean that Jesus sits at the power of God? Jesus is the power of God. Do they mean both? How do you translate both then? Do you say Jesus sits at the right hand slash power of God when you're writing a translation? It's not very easy. Um, their basic principle, NRSV, NASV in general, is as literal as possible, as free as necessary. There's a lot of gray space in there. Other translations, such as today's English version, have a meaning for meaning translation. So they're not going to always use the same words. It's more trying to get the meaning. But then they have to decide what the meaning is. So now, when you read today's English version, you're trusting their scholars on what the meaning of the text is. And you have to decide if you want to do that. Um, then others, like the Living Bible, the message or paraphrases, less literal, freer attempts to help the average reader immediately understand every word. Now, a lot of people used to use the New Living Bible translation. It's not a translation. It shouldn't be called a translation. It's a paraphrase. They use the English to just make up their own version of it. Uh, there's good for that. There's also negative. With the message in the New Living Bible, they're making it really easy to kind of understand the gist of it. But... They're giving you one way to understand it, pretty much. And often, Scripture is layer upon layer of meaning. It's full of poetry and, and layers of, of words. So when you paraphrase all that, you're getting one person's idea of what this Scripture is, where you don't get to choose for yourself. Because often in the Hebrew, it's very poetic. They'll use words that rhyme, or they'll use words that play on each other to kind of make you think of something else. Now, when we read it in the English, we don't get all of that. Because we don't get to see that Hebrew poetry. So good translations try to somehow maintain the poetic license of it without just saying, here's what it means. You lose that when you have these paraphrases. The good of those are, sometimes if you hold that with another Bible, it gives you a fresh new look at the scripture. So I'll use the message sometimes in church after I read the other version or the text we've heard so many times just to kind of make us think of it in a new way. But if you only use those for study, you're really limiting yourself on what the scriptures can do. So a little example. So the less literal the translation, the more likely it will reflect the translator's perspective. So again, you have to trust that. So look at these texts from Hosea as translated in the NRSV and the TEV. Remember the TEV is a a meaning for meaning. They're choosing the meaning and giving it to you. So Hosea 4 and 19. A wind has wrapped them in its wings. In our SV. They will be carried away as by the wind. T-E-V. Hosea 12, 1. Ephraim herds the wind and pursues the east wind all day long. In our SV. Everything the people of Israel do from morning to night is useless and destructive. T-E-V. Very different, Right? That's how important it is to, un to choose your Bible. Chances are you probably find the TEV easier to understand than the more little in RSV. But what you gain in quickness, you lose in depth. The image of the wind in the NRSV, for example, makes you stop and ponder the meaning. 
what's really happening, what are they getting at the different levels. You are able to extrapolate more meaning for yourself with the more literal translations where more of the meaning has been interpreted for you in the looser translations. So you have to decide what kind of Bible you need and for what purpose. So we'll look at more of the questions you should ask if any Bible next week. But as always, if you're ever wondering what kind of Bible I should get, feel free to come and ask and we can talk about what do you need it for. What kind of things do you want to do? Do you want to be able to do more research with it or just get one meaning? And it's always important to really look at it. Like a story, my father-in-law years ago wanted to get a Bible for my mother-in-law. He was asking what kind. And I said, well, do you want to study Bible so that you can really use your Bible studies? He's, he's like, yeah. So I said, get the Harper Christian uh, NRSV study Bible, annotated study Bible. It has good notes from top professors in the U.S., so he went online and found something that was called the 8C Study Bible, thinking it was Harper Collins. It was not. It was like Holman Christian Family Study Bible. Uh, I don't know anything about the Harper but I was looking at some of the text. I'm like, well, this is not a good translation. It was completely different than the typical things you would do because they had a very clear agenda of what they were trying to get across in their Bible with a clear perspective. And we're going to translate it so people believe this is what the Bible says. That's how important it is. You can go far off if you don't kind of get the, the right thing. Because everybody has their Bible. Sometimes pe churches will publish their own Bible that says we want to say what we wanted to say. And you can play around with translations. I mean, you can go, uh, I mean, uh, my wife bought my father-in-law a copy of Marcus Aurelius's uh, Meditations for Christmas. And the one he had wanted, according to looked at, it's like, well, the person who translated this has no qualifications to be a translator. It might have been on Google Translator just paraphrasing English translations. So she made sure she got one by actual like Roman scholars translated from original. Because otherwise, anybody can make a copy of something in the common domain. I can go find an old, old copy of Meditations or uh, you know, uh, Art of War and kind of redo it from an English and make it my own and say, here's a translation of it, somebody buy it. Would you trust that? I wouldn't. So that's why it's always important to kind of consider these different questions and what you need from a Bible. So we'll look at more of those questions next week of what to think of translations and give more examples of how different translations can be sometimes. Questions, comments, snide remarks. Yes. Yeah, it's a new revised standard version. That's what we have in our pews here. The reason Presbyterians use that in part is because a lot of the scholars who translated both the RSV and the NRSV were Presbyterian. The kind of chair of the interpretation committee was a guy named Bruce Metzger, professor at Princeton. So it's really, I find it the best version that kind of holds as little as they can, but when they need to, gives you the meaning so you get the most out of the text while still trying to give you more freedom to interpret yourself. I think they do the best job of that. What's TEV? Today's English version. Not the English common. Com no, that's CEV. There's also CEV, contemporary English mm -hmm. version. There's common English Bible, today's English version, contemporary English version. All of them are different. So if you ever want, I have a bunch of different ones in my office, and you can look at them. Or there's a site called Bible Gateway. So sometimes go to BibleGateway.com, click in a verse that's kind of interesting that may be confusing, and you can go in and look at all the different translations, King James, CEB, TEV, CEV, NRSV, NAS, New Jerusalem Bible, all of them, and see how they're different. And you'll see lots of difference in a lot of key verses. Check New American, uh, New American Standard Bible, it goes really hard on like trying to do literal word for word from the Hebrew and the Greek. They try to get the meaning, but they'll use the literal best words, not always the best meaning. All right, thank you very much.